Thank you very much, John, and thank you very much for having me. I feel very honoured to be part of um, such an eminent group of people who are interested in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, uh, it's, you know, we've heard right from why it's a huge, huge global issue um, through to how it's involving lots of other systems and not just the liver in its relationship with cardiology and endocrinology. Um, and we've heard about how uh, there might be better ways to streamline care between primary care and secondary care using automated systems and pathways for managing liver disease. So, and we've also heard from Professor Muris about the context in which we as general practitioners are working, um, our patient-centered care, holistic care, and how some of the structures in terms of chronic disease management work in the primary care setting and really highlighting the role of the multidisciplinary team, particularly the practice nurses and the nurse practitioners in chronic disease management. So I'm hoping over the next 20 minutes or so just to bring some of that together into my thoughts around what our role in primary care should be, um, why we should have a role, do we currently have a role, and what are the challenges, or some of the challenges in developing this role within primary care? And more importantly, what are the opportunities for primary care? What's our niche within this going forward? So just going back a little bit, obviously, you know, I don't want to underestimate the importance of primary prevention in, in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease on a global level. I don't think primary care is the answer, and I don't think secondary care is the answer. It has to be seen in the context of uh, public health, um, like Professor Muris was saying, close collaboration between public health and primary care and secondary care, health promotion, fiscal med measures, health policy. These are all hugely important, and it's how we play our role within that to take things forward. Come on, chaps. <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> But, um, and I think primary care spans all of these pre prevention paradigms really, but I guess most people would think of our role really within that secondary prevention, finding people before significant disease develops and preventing the sequelae of, of those diseases. Um, and John's already highlighted this. Uh, well, why do we need to bother with this? And if we're thinking about it from a liver perspective, and we can also think about cardiovascular and other outcomes as well, but as a GP with an interest in liver disease more generally, this is what we're trying to prevent. And, and John's already talked about the horrendous uh, figures around what happens to people if they present for the first time with decompensated cirrhosis, not known to anyone um, beforehand, either in the secondary or the primary care world. So... And this is just to say that, and again, this has already been covered somewhat, but that really definitions are important and the way that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is framed um, to guide people within primary care and more generally within health policy uh, is very important that we see it as part of something which already has momentum and already has impetus, and that is around management of multiple comorbidities in cardiometabolic comorbidity. And I think that um, a definition that acknowledges that um, may have impact in terms of how things are taken forward. This uh, diagram... Oh, it's not the right... Is that, is that the light? Oh, yeah. Here is just from a, from a paper um, written by Targa and et al. talking about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as part of that multi-system disease requiring that multidisciplinary holistic approach. And um, sorry, it's not very clear, but as we've talked about already, there are so many people that need to be involved. But I would like to think that we within primary care could almost be in that circle with the patient we, we, we are looking after the whole patient. We, certainly in the UK, liaise with all of the different specialties, get letters back from all of the different specialties. And I don't know how it is in other countries, but a lot of the time that communication between specialties is even harder than it is from primary care to secondary care and back. Uh, and the other thing to uh, sort of put to that is that, as Professor Muris has intimated, it's what we do in primary care 
we manage multiple conditions, we manage the whole patient, we, we advocate for them as a person, what's important to them, um, and we're very used to talking people, to people about their Q risk scores, about statins, about uh, how to reduce their uh, cardiometabolic risk, about lifestyle management. Um, and I was fairly insulted the other day at, at a meeting I was at, um, run by a certain committee in the UK, where they sort of said, it was actually a GP that said this, uh, well, someone in primary care can't give someone lifestyle advice about NAFLD. That has to come from the hepatologist. And, and I thought, you know, this is, this is what we do day in, day out. It's not, NAFLD shouldn't be considered as something out with and different to this other work that we're doing in chronic disease management. So um, if we should have a central role, do we have a central role? Um, and John already mentioned this new um, systematic review and narrative synthesis, which just came out yesterday, which is looking at whether there are community pathways for early detection and risk stratif stratification for chronic liver disease. And the search strategy was, was, a, was global. It wasn't limited to UK studies. There were some um, caveats in that it was, I think, English language published papers and from the year two. 1990 onwards um, but th this whole huge review looking at community pathways for managing chronic liver disease in general not just NAFLD but including NAFLD eventually was uh, synthesized down to 12 pathways that had been published 10 of which were UK based um, there was an acknowledgement that the clinical practice is ahead of research in this area and there may be local pathways that have been set up that haven't been uh, published and have just been seen as quality improvement or service provision. Um, but there is a, d a dearth of uh, research around this area of whether we are in primary care and in the community playing a role in early detection of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I also did some work with the British Liver Trust looking at um, across the UK, e so even in the area where 10 out of 12 of the, these pathways have been published, um, whether from a commissioning perspective, so in the UK it's a bit of a mixed picture, but essentially in England we have commis cl clinical commissioning groups who commission primary health care, um, and in Scotland and Wales there are equivalent sort of health boards. But usually within each clinical commissioning group or health board there would generally be somebody who would be responsible for acute care and chronic disease management and uh, various other aspects of health. So we sent a survey to these health boards asking them whether they had anyone in their CCG or health board who was responsible for liver disease. Um, and only 20% only of um, health boards or CCGs had anyone named as being responsible for liver disease. And we then went on to ask them um, whether they had uh, pathways in place to diagnose liver disease, both from the point of view of interpreting abnormal liver blood tests, so a sort of reactive pathway, or, and or whether they had a more proactive pathway to find people at risk of liver disease within their communities. And this map shows you the areas in red where they, didn't, they said they didn't have either of those pathways in place in a kind of systematic regional way. Um, areas in yellow, whether they either had pathways in development or just had a pathway for responding to abnormal liver blood tests, and the path areas in green where they had comprehensive pathways of care in place. So as you can see, even within the country where most of the research is happening and we're possibly ahead in terms of community pathway development for finding non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in the community, there's still huge parts of the country where it's not, not happening. I'm obviously pleased to say that both Manolis and uh, John's areas are in green. <laughs> so if we don't currently have a role, what, what are the challenges to developing this role? How, how, can, how can we as primary care be, become involved in this role? Um, well, I mean, the way I sort of see it is, is it's, it's kind of, it's about systems and systems integration. And I think, you know, we've, we've got, we've got, you know the oh, we've got the IT ILFTs um, that John's developed. We've got pathways such as the pathway that Manlis has developed in London. We've got the scans 
um, that we, we know are, are, are useful. We've got the scoring systems, which we know are, are, are good, good negative predictive values. So we've sort of got most of the hardware in place. We've got quite a lot of the software in place for managing these patients, but we don't have a kind of integrated system to bring it all together yet. Um, and a lot of that, I think, is around researching how these, what are, what are the what are the barriers to these being implemented? Where where are the where are the sticking points? Is it to to do with health policy? Is it to do with GPs not being interested? Is it to do with that they don't think there's any point in it? Is it to do with lack of guidelines? Um, how can we bring together to get this kind of more system integration in the way we manage? non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So some work that I'm recently um, is in press at the moment, it's not quite published yet, um, was some qualitative work that I've done with GPs and nurses in primary care in the north of England, um, interviewing GPs about this, about the barriers and facilitators to finding not liver disease in primary care, and more specifically the barriers and facilitators to integrating it within chronic disease management and multimorbidity care within primary care. And the um, sort of theoretical underpinning of the qualitative research for those who might be interested, is, is, is a sort of implementation science theory around normalization process theory. So it's basically saying what needs to happen for things to become normalized in people's both their understanding and their actions to make things happen within, within processes, complex interventions. So the themes that came across within the work um, were, were firstly around organizational barriers to care. Um, and I think it was interesting, some of the questioning at the last uh, round table around how, how, how can we get GPs to, um, to, to be involved or do something about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But the fact is, like we've talked about, is we, 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 we're like swamped with guidelines and the, the, everything being the most important thing, whether it's dementia or cancer or mental health or um, chronic disease management. So um, a lot of what we end up prioritizing, certainly in the UK, is almost decided at a kind of higher health pol policy level and organization of care being very important. And what the GPs that I spoke to um, and the nurses talked about was the reason that they hadn't managed non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in this more standardized way was uh, because there weren't any protocols or frameworks and the framework that primary care in the UK tends to kind of work within is a sort of quite a sort of centralized government incentivized framework in terms of what is deemed to be important enough to, to, to work on that financial year essentially called the quality outcomes framework or QOF. So liver disease or, or NAFLD, none of the indicators had ever mentioned liver disease or NAFLD so they didn't feel that they had that framework. And it wasn't so much that they valued the money that came with that framework. It's just as soon as a framework is deemed to be legitimized and important, then all sorts of clever IT people and other people jump into action and develop protocols and uh, you know, nice, smooth pathways of care so that it can be integrated within systems. So I won't read out all of the quotes, but this is just from somebody who's a diabetic lead, GP partner in a practice for 35 years, so very highly qualified, but basically saying that, you know, it, it, he, he admits that they used this quaff, these outcome frameworks to sort of concentrate the mind and decide when something is of relevance to be used and, and that when things drop on and off this incentivized framework, it very much influences what's done even though clinical care and guidelines haven't changed. The second thing that came across was really about, and we've talked a lot about this, is it's really crucial for primary care practitioners, nursing staff and, and GPs to view liver disease as part of multimorbidity, separate it off from knowing about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and Wilson's disease. And they don't, all they need to know about those things is that if they find it, they refer it to secondary care. They don't need to know any more than that. But what they do need to think about is how non-alcoholic fatty liver disease fits within their multimorbidity chronic disease management and dual pathology, alcohol and fatty liver disease, and alcohol, because it's also a risk factor for lots of other chronic diseases. So if when I spoke to patients and talked to them about um, 
uh, how would they feel about integrating NAFLD and alcohol-related liver disease as part of a multi-morbidity chronic disease management, what it would physically mean for them in terms of changing the way they did their annual checks or reviews for patients with cardiovascular disease or chronic kidney disease or hypertension. Particularly the nursing staff were very much like, well, yeah, that sounds, that sounds fine. That sounds like it's perfectly doable, could easily be encompassed. We're already doing a couple more bloods. We're already doing the BMI. Um, we're looking at other risk factors. So I don't think that would make a huge difference to care. And that was including additioning things like putting in Fib4, for example. The other thing that came across quite strongly was that there was a difference in the, the, there's the this what is the point question. And actually, it was the GPs um, uh, who were the, the primary care physicians who were more resistant to this and felt that there was little point in doing it because we're already, you know, uh, they come back the next year, their ALT is still raised, they're still fat, you know, uh, we don't have a drug, essentially. So still very much in the medical, medical model, whereas the nurses, uh, nursing staff and some of the GPs uh, were much more seeing lifestyle intervention as a uh, beneficial treatment and that adding in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease to that chronic disease management could uh, incentivize, incentivize patients, give them additional information to be able to make those changes themselves within their lifestyle. Um, so nurses tended to see much more of a value in finding non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and taking it forward. So the key recommendations from that uh, qualitative work that I've just done was really that we need integrated and incentivized frameworks and protocols to dr drive that communal understanding as well as organize and sustain practice and they may need to come up from higher than just an individual GP looking at a guideline and deciding that's what they're going to do. Really we need to shift and think of NAFLD as part of multi-morbidity care, separate it from um, some of the other rarer causes of liver disease to make it more doable within the framework of how we work in primary care. And we need to do a lot of education to be able to define um, what the role of the general practitioner is within that sort of lifestyle-focused treatment pathway for them to better understand the value of change. So what opportunities do we have in primary care? Well, I've highlighted some of those, but I think we can also learn from other diseases. Um, you know, up until 10 years ago, a lot of GPs had never heard of chronic kidney disease. And now it's part of everyday practice. Every time we see anyone with, uh, you know, cardiovascular disease or hypertension or diabetes, they, we, we, we understand what CKD is. We understand what it means. We understand when to do uh, check the urines for ACRs and what that means and how that affects prognosis. And th that's been a very successful campaign. I don't know by whom, but to get that integrated into chronic disease management. We also need to really um, value and... Um, realize the role of patient advocacy and the patient role within this because really a, a sort of personalized story and they come over and over again and, and I've done quite a bit of work with the British Liver Trust around um, the endless stories of you know missed diagnoses and blood tests being repeated and patients presenting with decompensated cirrhosis that's what politicians and health policy makers listen to yes they love listening to graphs and big data as well but to really get at people's heartstrings and get things done and and i think primary care has a role in working with those groups and finding those um, patients and, and family members who can help us make the case um, in terms of where primary care sits as well, I think it needs to be it needs to be front and center, or at least involved um, with research that's going on in this sphere to give that sort of implementation and on the ground perspective about what is and isn't going to work within the setting. Um, and these sort of multidisciplinary alliances within research mean that we can be ready for the next big thing. There's always big changes in um, the way that health is structured suddenly something becomes trendy if we're ready to get in there with a big study to say yeah we're, we're ready to go on this or, or we've got we've got the perfect pathway of care for this um uh you know we, we can be ready for those big health uh institute research calls or to slot into the new systems of working in in our countries to be able to to make it central the other very very quick point is that the other big thing that always comes up um, within primary care is early detection of cancer. It's a big push in the UK at least, and certainly um, there may be some way of primary care 
getting more involved in NAFLD if the focus becomes slightly shifted to being around early detection of HCC and how that fits into um, our kind of early cancer detection pathways. So to summarise, I think primary care does have a central role in the NASH epidemic, but there are challenges and we need to develop and define a clinical role um, for GPs better. Um, we as primary care, and I'm very pleased to say that the hepatology world in the UK has, is shifting towards much more community-based primary care research. Um, we need to be involved in research and the big studies and pathway implementation is crucial. And health policy to get people interested and involved in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the sort of carrots rather than the sticks, or getting it labelled as part of multimorbidity care, using cancer, early cancer diagnosis and, that, and the increasing rates of HCC as a, as, a, as a carrot, and involving patient groups. Thank you.